Hello and welcome to episode 75 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is my gardening podcast. On this week's episode, I'm talking about gardening between the gales, between the gusts of wind that have bookmarked both ends of this week. I'm talking about planting hardy cranesbill geraniums, a vast, vast amount of them. I'm talking about disappointing compost batches. How heartbreaking, something that you have dedicated a quarter of the year to and lets you down. I'm talking about the pleasure of removing old landscaping and creating a place for new plants. And I also have an exciting recommendation for those of you who like magic. Anyway, enough of this introduction. Let's get on with the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening, a week lived in the calm between two rushing slabs of wind. I began on Monday morning, up a couple of hours before dawn, listening to the last of the storm blow itself out and howling down the chimney in that incredibly deep resonant way. A house really is a, a big wind instrument if you blow hard enough on it. I'm recording this as another storm passes over us and you might occasionally hear this wailing, moaning sound which is, is some sort of piece of errant plastic on the window that is being hit at the right resonant frequency and is making this, this ghoulish scream. So apologies for that. Anyway, on Monday morning I was, I was listening to a deeper sound as the chimney roared. And you sit there waiting for the moment until you have to go and do battle with the elements, like a little creature, a little furry something in its hole, listening to giants storm and crunch around outside. Eventually I did get on my bicycle and cycle off to work. And although we had been bombarded with rain the day before, the wind was moving so quickly that it had whisked the clouds away. They were gone somewhere towards Scandinavia. And we had this scoured clean sky and a bright and full moon. And so I, I pedalled out trying to reach the moon. And at times I was almost entirely stationary on my bicycle, battling through the wind. I got onto to Vauxhall Bridge which is where I cross over the Thames and was pedalling as hard as I could and going nowhere and watching the few pedestrians around me do that strange stuttering sideways walk that looks as if we're all in a in a big shoebox and someone's picked it up and put it under their arm and is jogging off with it. You're all trying desperately to keep their balance against the forces pushing them. I got to Hyde Park as it was starting to get light and that's where I got the first hint of the damage we had suffered. There are all sorts of bits of tree lying under that big double avenue of plane trees they had there. The Royal Parks had been shut the day before due to the high winds, but no trees had come down, just great big sticks. And because they're, they're sticks from a couple of years ago, the dead wood, they don't have any twigs or old leaves on them. They're just wonderfully contorted bits of wood. So they look like great big anacondas lying on the grass between the trees. It's almost as if we were cycling through a, a jungle that had been hit by a polar vortex and all the creatures, the anacondas, had tumbled down from the trees to, to lie frozen on the ground. The effect is occasionally particularly telling if you get a bit of wood that's managed to hang around in the canopy for three or four years after it actually died. When it falls, it fragments, almost like an icicle. It breaks into sometimes 15, 16, 25 pieces in the shape of a branch on the ground. So I cycled past a few of those in great excitement, knowing exactly what was, what was to come when I got to work. On the other side of the journey, I, I put my bike on the train and, and got off and cycled up, up to the Chilterns. And there are a few trees down on the way to work. So I thought there might be some serious chainsaw action. 
But actually, we came off relatively unscathed. There were lots of twigs. The dead wood that I had seen in Hyde Park had been shaken down also from, from our trees. But no roots were exposed. No trees had come toppling sideways. And so it was a morning of, of going around with the wheelbarrow, collecting these twigs. It's funny how they all shed a different thing. And the beech trees tend to shed old branches. And the birch tree sheds incredibly fine, very dry twigs, like, like vermicelli needles. And the larch trees shed tangled masses of, of little cone and twig. And you go around as gardener and you collect these little pieces of, of dendral dandruff. It was the horticultural equivalent of a, of a sharp double brush on the shoulder of your, of your black suit. The afternoon was spent dealing with the vast amount of twiggy shakedown. It takes quite a long time to chip it because we're using a, a very small, almost domestic model electric chipper which has a tiny little hopper and you need to shove everything through it and it gets blocked. And actually, after a whole morning's collection, we only had enough chips in the end to fill one builder's dumpy bag. I was quite excited though because it's a dumpy bag full of very, very dry, dead matter, which goodness knows we're going to need later in the year. I'm going to be talking about tragedies in the compost heap when I get to describing the activities of Wednesday and it will become clear how much we need this, this brown matter. With the garden clean and the brushwood all chipped, I went home on Monday feeling that we had dodged a bullet, feeling that we had escaped unscathed. And actually it wasn't a particularly pleasant feeling. It was like getting into some sort of righteous fight, some sort of morally unimpeachable punch-up where you're defending some, some poor downtrodden person who can't stand up for themselves. And if you're going to do this, you want to come out with some sort of heroic looking black eye or a cosmetic wound of some sort. And our garden had survived its battle with the February weather and it didn't even have an attractive cut on its cheekbone to show from it. Luckily, on Tuesday morning, I found that cosmetic injury I was investigating a stand of spruce trees that I hadn't gone to on Monday. And these spruce trees have the habit of old spruce trees planted too close together. If you have ever been into a spruce plantation, planted for its timber, you'll know them. They grow very straight and they shed all of their lower limbs. For what is the point of lower limbs when no light will ever reach them? And the effect is one that is there's almost architectural. You feel like you're going between the dark submerged legs of an offshore oil rig when you wander into into the cavern between them. They are they are stark columns that look like someone has whacked in countless nails where the old branches have come off. And in the middle of this most unwelcoming and most unsympathetic area lay a perfect plump Christmas tree about 12 foot high on its side and for a moment I thought oh goodness gosh that must have blown a long way where's that come from before I realized of course this is what the sunlit uplands of these spruce trees look like the bit that I never see they're crowded together canopies where there is pointed having needles still this is what it's like up there that's what the sun and the clouds see when they look down upon it and I never do and the top 12 feet had been had been blown off and tumbled down and it really was like like finding a, a corpse in a locked room mystery where there's nothing around it and, and where can it possibly have come from maybe my brain was working particularly slowly but it's a pity that it came down two months too late, because it really was more impressive than anything you'd buy on a, on a garage forecourt or outside a pub, which is where they sell Christmas trees round near me. Never mind, we do not choose when our trees snap. We just choose how to deal with them. And this one I dragged into the bracken to, to deal with some other time. For I had geraniums to plant. I was planting 458 geraniums in two litre pots and these were hardy geraniums of an identical cultivar Mrs Kendall Clark. If you can't picture a two litre geranium what I'm talking about is the pot size 
So imagine two litres of water. If you can't imagine two litres of water, imagine four personal bottles of water, the kind that destroy the planet and, and David Attenborough really does not like. Four of those, tip them out in some sort of vessel. That vessel is two litres. Now imagine that vessel filled with soil and geranium roots, and that's what you've got times 458. It's quite a good size, two litres. It means that the plant has been in there for a year, a couple of years. It's got its roots out. It's, it's getting going. Unless you go to one of those nurseries that, that fobs you off with a little slip that they've just put into a two-litre pot. And you've bought two litres of compost for the price of a full plant. And you think, no, I'm not standing for this. Luckily, the nursery that had delivered my Mrs. Kendall Clark had let her roots run through the soil thoroughly. These geraniums are for a semi-wild, semi-planted driveway that we have, an understory of a lightly wooded area. I want the monoculture because I want it to look like they have been adventitiously colonised by one species in the same way that you will sometimes get nettles or wild garlic or bluebells taking over, taking over a light woodland understory. The wood above is a monstrously outgrown hornbeam hedge that long ago escaped the, the billhook and the, the gardener's loppers and has grown itself up to tree size. So it has these wonderful silvery hornbeam trunks with almost that diamond shark skin pattern lightly etched in. And I've chosen Mrs. Kendall Clark as my hardy geranium to complement that. I didn't want anything too vivid, too bright a magenta like many of those cranes bells are, or too bright a blue like, like those Roseanne type cultivars. I'm thinking that washed out pearlescent colour of the Mrs. Kendall Clark, that summer's day sky in a photograph that's been left out in the sunshine. That's the kind of blue that I want. And I've, I've followed slightly the lines of sun and shade in setting out these vast amounts of geraniums. I want it to look like a woodland where, where you get this understory colonising the, the little glades, the little openings within the, within the woods. So I, I follow where there's a little bit of light and I will be helped over the coming years by the actual circumstances. I'm certain that some of these plants will die and some will thrive. Those that die will probably give me one year of flowering, but flowering in that spidery, sprawling manner of a plant desperate to be anywhere but where it is. And those that I've hit in the right place will bulk up into, into wonderful geranium-y mounds. And in three or four years' time, they will be situated as if they had all colonised the wood naturally. The idea in this part of the garden is to confuse those with, without a horticultural hinterland into thinking that all of the plants arrived serendipitously. I have actually achieved a, a great aim in this area when I was having a conversation with someone about it and they said, gosh, isn't it lucky? Isn't it fantastic the way nature works? The way all that grass appeared and just looks absolutely perfect there. How strange that it's only here. And I thought to myself, how strange indeed, how strange that it's perfect and only here. I wonder how that could be. And I held my tongue. No, I didn't. I didn't. I wish. I wish I had the strength to, to hold my tongue. But of course, I, I gloated and boasted and said, <laughs> my dear fellow, it looks so perfect because, because it is mine. It is my creation. And um, that, that sort of spoiled it for all of us, I guess. But, but anyway, I hope that happens again with these geraniums and they can blend in so perfectly. You won't be surprised to hear that me and my colleague did not get all of our geraniums planted in one day. There remain some of the, the 458 left to go in. But we got a good start in it, and we'll come back and, and, and wallop those into the ground later. I was planting with my favourite trenching shovel, which is the perfect implement for, for a two-litre hole. And I did enough heaving it in the air and smashing it down into the ground to go home with a, with a pleasant ache in the arms. On Wednesday, I matched the arm ache with a little bit of a leg ache. It was a very cold, 
clear day, a hard frost on the ground, white roofs showing off where people have insulation problems. I warmed up by barrowing a load of compost up from our heap to put in some newly created beds. And it was very disappointing. This was the second load of compost to come out of the heap last summer and has been sitting since then in a little maturation heap. And I'd hoped it would be wonderfully soft and friable and fine and beautiful black gold. And it was black, certainly, but it was heavy and claggy and disappointing. Very, very hard to barrow uphill. A barrow of the stuff weighed more than than a barrow of iron, probably. It certainly felt that way. And, um, and I was quite distraught about this. It's like when you bake a cake, which I occasionally do. And if you bake a cake that is a known crowd pleaser, a favourite that you have served several times and, and reaped the plaudits, and then you have people around and you say, well, I know, I'd bake that chocolate cake that always gets me so much praise. And you bake it and it just goes wrong for some reason. It doesn't rise. You get this little flat thing that looks like a, a shoe that you might see next to a motorway. And everyone's very polite about it, of course they are. And they say it tastes delicious. And it does taste delicious, because it's it's a load of butter and sugar. Of course it tastes delicious. But you know it could be so much better. It could have the right texture. And yes, my compost will be fine and it has organic matter and it will improve the soil. But I know, I know it could be so much better. And for that, I was sorely disappointed. And now we hear why I am so pleased to have all those chippings from the storm earlier. I'm going to ration the brown material this year far better. I'm not going to go gung-ho and tip in the the 12 tonnes of leaves that we've saved up into the first batch. I'm going to put 8 tonnes in the first batch and I'm going to save 6 and I'm going to save six tons for the second batch. And I'm going to save sawdust. I'm going to save wood chippings. I'm going to get cardboard. I'm going to make sure that it doesn't get swamped in grass and late herbaceous flappy leaves like this lot. Anyway, you probably want to hear more about the area we were barrowing compost to. It is a new area we have reclaimed from under a hedge. This is a big mature beech hedge. And beech hedges are a tempting prospect for the gardener, particularly at this time of year, because there is nothing more glorious in mid-February than seeing a deciduous hedge colonised with snowdrops. There they somehow look right. On a big flat plain, as we have in some parts of the garden with the densest snowdrops population, they don't seem to, to work as well. They need a slope or a feature, something interesting. And I find that the the natural mounding you get at the base of a hedge, combined with the trees around it and the trunks, make them the perfect snowdrop place. And always before, I had thought about underplanting this for snowdrops and began to dig and hit concrete and realised, oh, there's some structure underneath this hedge. I'll put these snowdrops somewhere else. And this year, once more, it happened again. And my colleague, who is a sensible fellow, said, well, why don't we just take whatever it is out? And so we did. It was a satisfying sort of job, working with the big wrecking bar, whacking it into the ground. There's a very satisfying thunk that you get when you smash something deep under the ground. It sounds like like a, a bunker busting bomb on a film a woomph sort of noise rather than a crash sort of noise so we broke up these these slabs and heaved out the mortar upon which they were lain and for once in the garden it wasn't over constructed it was a mortar more sand than cement it came up like a vast slab of muscovado sugar in both texture and and colour, but it clung together enough to form big shards, which still looked very impressive in the wheelbarrow. So to anyone watching us, it did look like we had dismantled a bunker with our bursting bombs. The the hedge itself is is beech that I think was probably planted alongside a little slab path in the 80s, as sort of whips, 
So first year plants are just a single stem straight up. And then over the next 30 or so years, it has grown out and over the path and buried it with a, a soil of its own making with with all of this leaf matter and, and bits and pieces that have been blown off the lawn and ended up in there. So you get you get quite a good compost on top. And that mixed with the new stuff we've put in is, is going to make really good, rich stuff. So we won't just have snowdrops in there we'll probably have some some other things knocking about under there it's a it's a joy in a mature garden to to suddenly have a big area to work with with no constraints and considerations we haven't had to chuck out a third of the herbaceous plants in this border to, to replant it we haven't had to to cull to cut to to order people off the life raft we've just got rid of a horrible old concrete path and created a new area for ourselves what joy so that was wednesday a day of wheelbarrowing and breaking and throwing things into skips i spent thursday in entirely different pursuits i was off doing my garden history day in the british library again quite looking forward to getting back into the Metropolitan Archives, hopefully in a, in a week or so's time. But I was at the British Library doing, doing some reading there, and I read various relevant stuff. I also read a short story by George Gissing. George Gissing, that famous miserablist, that famous novelist of the dour and downbeat. I was reading him because I saw that job advert I think it's been shared quite a lot now. They're looking for a a vine keeper at Hampton Court, and the vine keeper will have responsibility for that that magnificent old vine that's supposedly the oldest in the world and planted by capability brown and the biggest in the world and the only thing that you can do of note in that job as the last in the long succession of vine keepers is kill it. That's the only way to differentiate yourself. Gosh, what responsibility! And I remembered the Gissing story about a vine keeper. It turns out I misremembered it. It's actually about a cockney, a horrible cockney scallywag called Long Bill. And Long Bill is actually quite short, but he's so emaciated that they call him Long Bill. And he is taken by a good Samaritan, by a young lady philanthropist, to her country estate where the fresh air and the honest work of being a gardener will restore him to, to a rosy-cheeked healthfulness. And of course, Long Bill resents this, and he resents most of all having a head gardener and a boss and a routine, and he spends his time making himself sick by gorging on stolen produce from the kitchen garden and arguing with the head gardener about having to do any work. And finally, he gets up in the night, cuts all the vines in the vine house off at the ground and runs away before dying a few days later as a consumptive tramp. So, so far, so George Gissing. Let's hope that whoever gets the vine keeper job at Hampton Court will not die of tuberculosis nor make themselves sick on stolen goods. Anyway, that was Thursday. On Friday, I was back in the garden doing some gardening and once more protecting things from from a looming storm it was a day of stone moving and and hatch battening not that we have any any hatches to batten but metaphorically speaking i weighed down some tarpaulins with extra bits of rock i also cut back some dead wood from the various aces it is such a tragedy that in our garden, aces suffer from random limb dieback. And I know aces are finickety, and I know that they get wilt and scorch tips to their leaves, and if you look at them wrong or, or startle them, they'll, they'll start ailing. But here, maybe because we have an alkaline soil and they like things slightly acidic, they are prone to losing whole limbs, and you never know which one it's going to be. I think that it is not unique to the garden, nor does anything to do with my care, because I cycled past various aces on the way to the station, on the way down to Beaconsfield, and some of them suffer from the same thing. There's one glorious, magnificent front garden acer, a real, I will buy this house just for that tree kind of plant, that has lost one of the key structural limbs this year, and I feel so sorry for the homeowner. 
And I think if I lived in a garden that was based around Aces, one of those incredibly modern stone and gravel and Acer gardens, I would be in terror for for limb drop. I would lose even more, more sleep than I currently do. I think we might actually end up getting some, some more Aces. We have a, a cascade being built later in the year by, by a renowned Japanese stone manipulator. And I'm sure that there will be some, some serious ace spending going on in that in that time. So, so that's when I will get my anxiety levels up to the maximum. Anyway, it was it was sad I went round and, and cut them out. None of the trees have been too badly affected. There's not going to be much imbalance. But it, it it is a concern. I think when I'm specifying the next batch of small trees, we'll try and, and keep away from Aces as much as we, we love those trees. The wind started to pick up over the afternoon, so I scurried out of the garden, flushed out by, by the bangs of various sheeting and bits of bits of construction material knocking about. On my way home I cycled down this this stockbroker's road. I'm sorry that this is so cycling based. Uh, this week, but, but horticultural jobs sometimes thin out a little bit. And um, on the way home, I cycled past all these stockbrokers' houses. And at four o'clock exactly, all of their tradesmen were scurrying out as well, all their vans nosing out of the driveways, like the eels looking out of a coral wreath, checking if the, the shark has swum past or not. And they all nosed their little noses out and then scoffed off onto the road. And um, and I cycled past. In London, it's it's quite a nice time of year because it's that strange dusk. Light has just gone. People haven't yet closed their curtains, so you can very nosily cycle past all of the extravagant houses in Mayfair and look in. There's one that has this huge library that I go past, full of leather-bound tomes right up to the ceiling. But it's a it's a dead, dull, lifeless library. It feels like one of the ones that I'd go to research garden history in because they haven't got any any personal touches. I think if I was rich enough to have my own wood panelled library, I would have a big fireplace in a couple of alcoves with a, with a human skull and a and a very out of fashion philosopher's bust in and all of those things. This person must have no taste. Anyway, we can hear more about that on some other podcasts. We do not want interior design tips from our horticultural podcasts. No, sir. Instead, let's see if I have any recommendations for you this week. Just one recommendation this week, and it is of a particularly personal nature. If you go to bendark.com forward slash books, you will see that I have a small series of horticultural murder mysteries coming out over the course of the year. And these murder mysteries are entirely silly and frivolous. They're, they're supernatural in origin. They're about a head gardening dryad who can talk to plants. It's it's nonsense, really, but also quite good fun and quite funny. And the first one ha- has just come out in paperback and is available to buy. I'm going to read you the blurbs for, for them, if I may. The first one is called, rather remarkably, Roses are red, violets kill you. And the sales patter goes... Whittleshin has a pub, a church, a fresh corpse, and some of the highest levels of background magic ever recorded. The corpse is new, the magic is not. It's why the head gardener at Pentdown Hall, Albertus Oak, can talk to trees, why his forbidding new boss knows so many spells, and why there's a wolf pulling pints in the bull and firkin. In this corner of England, life has ploughed its own strange furrow for centuries, but with property developers lurking in the hedgerows and a plan to turn the herbaceous borders into a poison garden, Albertus Oak must fight to preserve his unusual haven, all while hunting a cold-blooded killer. Gosh, that's exciting stuff. The second one is called Blood is Thicker Than Cider, 
and that is coming out let me see when that's coming out that's going to be out in paperback on may the 18th uh, blood is thicker than cider a is for apple b is for blood Whittleshin is rebranding itself for the autumn. Pumpkins are out, watercolour paintings are in. But when bodies start appearing in the orchards, the villagers suspect that someone is not ready to give up the traditions of the season. Albertus Oak reunites his band of sleuths to clear out the bad apples and bring in the harvest, but as old feuds are uncovered and new ones set in motion, it becomes clear that the past is not the only thing that haunts the village. More exciting stuff. And the third in the trilogy is called Dead Druids Society. Albertus Oak doesn't trust writers. Well, bad luck, because Pent Down Hall is full of them. It's hosting a nature writing weekend, and the star attraction is celebrity orchid hunter Jocko Wilkinson. But as the literati become the throat literati, Albertus realises that some writers are much less trustworthy than others. Only with the help of his friends and a few choice plants will the gardening dryad discover which guest needs to be pruned. So apologies uh, for all of that nonsense for writing it and for and for selling it to you. But if that is of any interest, then you can find it at bendark.com forward slash books. It only remains for me to thank you very much for listening. I hope that if anyone was affected more badly by the storms than, than we were in the garden, that you are now somewhere safe and dry, and the damage to, to garden or to, to home or, or to whatever else isn't, isn't too bad and is something that you can get over. I'm sure we are all turning a corner towards spring now, but that obviously is no consolation to, to someone who's, whose home is two foot deep in water, so, so my thoughts go out to all of you. If your garden is not underwater, then hopefully this week you might get out into it and, and see what's about and in flower. At work we have a huge amount out and in flower. Lots of Daphne, lots of little dwarf irises, the snowdrops, the butterbur are out in the hedgerows carpeting everything. It's an exciting time of year. Spring is upon us and we are powerless to resist. So tune in next week for, for more talk of the encroaching floral wave. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. Mm-hmm.